Now we'll take a look at our Riddle Air flight as an example of commercial air traffic and how they use ATC services. The example we just looked at was made using Visual Flight Rules or VFR. Ernie was able to navigate just by looking outside and didn't have to fly through any clouds. Airline flights, on the other hand, are operated under Instrument Flight Rules or IFR. They use the flight instruments in the aircraft to navigate through clouds and at extremely high altitudes. Riddle Air Flight 1926 is being flown today by Captain Jane and First Officer John. Just like Ernie did before his flight, the Captain and First Officer both receive a weather briefing, but this one comes from a company dispatcher instead of a flight service station briefer. Although they could call flight service, the dispatcher has already created a briefing that includes other important information they'll need to print out and take with them on their flight. This flight will require a flight plan as well. The submission of their IFR flight plan will notify all the air traffic control facilities along the route when to expect the aircraft and what route they plan on taking. The flight plan has been filed and taken care of by the dispatcher as well. Heading out to the aircraft, the crew completes the pre-flight preparations. Part of this includes getting their IFR clearance. Filing the flight plan is really more like a request. It includes the altitude and route the crew would like to take, but it's really up to the review of ATC to decide on what the final arrangements will be. The official route is given to the crew in their clearance. The first officer listens to the ATIS at Daytona Beach and then calls clearance delivery. Uh, Daytona clearance, Riddle 1926, IFR to Memphis, information Charlie. Riddle 1926, Daytona Clearance, cleared to the Memphis International Airport is filed. Maintain 4000, expect flight level 36010 minutes after departure. Departure frequency 123.9, squawk 5274. What this translates to is the flight is cleared to their filed destination, the Memphis Airport. They'll initially maintain 4,000 feet after departure, but once they're in contact with ATC and heading away from the airport, they can expect to climb higher. Finally, a squawk code is issued, and just like Ernie's flight, this will allow all the radar controllers along the route to locate the flight on their radar scopes. Recall from the airspace video the use of the term flight level. When pilots or controllers refer to an altitude at or above 18,000 feet, they'll use the term flight level and then shorten the altitude assignment to its first three digits. It saves time on the radio and reduces any confusion between high and low altitude assignments. So our flight can expect to cruise at 36,000 feet, or flight level 360. A couple minutes pass and the flight finishes boarding. Before pushback from the gate starts, the crew must have permission to move the aircraft. At larger airports, there is often a ramp controller who is in charge of movement that occurs in the alleys between concourses. They aren't air traffic controllers, but they are responsible for the safe movement of company vehicles on that section of the airport. Daytona isn't large enough to require a ramp controller for its terminal, so the crew calls ground control instead. Daytona Ground, Riddle 1926, Gate 5, ready for pushback. Riddle 1926, Daytona Ground, push at your discretion, advise when ready to taxi. The crew calls down to the ground crew for pushback, and the airplane is repositioned away from the gate where it's safe to start the engines. The necessary checklists are completed, and the crew is now ready to taxi. Daytona Ground, Riddle 1926, ready to taxi. Riddle 1926, runway 7 left, taxi via November. The captain and first officer review the taxi route on their airport diagrams and begin to taxi. Once at the runway, they switch frequencies and try to get their takeoff clearance from the tower. Daytona Beach Tower, Riddle 1926, holding short 7 left at November, ready for takeoff. Riddle 1926, Daytona Tower, hold short runway 7 left, landing traffic. At busy airports, aircraft often wait to take off for at least a little bit while the aircraft in front of them are landing or departing as well. Once the runway is clear and there is space to fit in a departure between the arriving aircraft, the tower calls the flight. Riddle 1926, wind 100 at 8, fly runway heading, runway 7 left, full length, cleared for takeoff. An interesting note about how the tower assembles this instruction. The runway name, intersection, and takeoff instruction are generally put at the end of the transmission. It's important that these are the last things the pilots hear in the instruction because a misinterpretation of these items could have dire consequences. The airplane lines up on the runway and begins a takeoff roll. Once safely airborne, the tower instructs the flight to switch to departure and bids them a good flight. Not every airport will have its own departure facility. In those cases, a nearby center will handle the departing aircraft. The Daytona Approach and Departure Facility looks similar to the Jacksonville Center we saw earlier. There are a handful of radar positions that are responsible for different portions of the airspace. 
The scopes look roughly the same too, and each of the radar targets have the same information as they did at the center. The main difference is that since the airspace around the Daytona airport is less complex than that of an ARTCC, there is only one specialist at each scope. Departure 1926 passing 1000 for 4000. Riddle 1926, Daytona departure, radar contact, turn left heading 300, proceed on course, climb and maintain 10000. Just like on Ernie's flight, the radar contact signifies that the controller has officially identified the flight on the radar scope and ATC in route services have begun. The first instruction has them turning away from the runway heading the tower assigned them, and will now have them intercepting their planned route, which they'll begin to follow. They're also now climbing to a higher altitude. They can't go directly up to a cruising altitude just yet since controllers are only allotted so much airspace between certain altitudes. They have to wait until they get a new controller to climb higher. Generally speaking though, the ascent to cruise is usually a smooth climb. They'll be talking to the next controller and getting a higher clearance before needing to level off at 10,000 feet. Riddle 1926, contact Jacksonville Center on 121.3. The flight is now leaving Daytona's airspace and will be talking to the different altitudes of the Jack Center until entering the state of Georgia. On this map, you can see all the different air route traffic control centers in the contiguous 48 states. Our flight, whose route is shown in green, will cross through the Jacksonville and Atlanta centers and finally into the Memphis Center. Once established on the cleared route, the crew's interaction with ATC will be fairly minimal for about the next hour and a half. The plane's autopilot will take care of all the navigating and is programmed to follow the same route that ATC has issued the crew. High altitude traffic is separated further apart than low altitude traffic, so you won't hear as much of the traffic calls that you'd expect on a flight similar to the first example. Occasionally, ATC might change the route or speed of the flight during cruise altitude for traffic control or to move them around severe weather. As the flight moves out of the jurisdiction of one specialist and into another's, a handoff is performed and the crew instructed to switch frequencies. Riddle 1926, contact Memphis Center on 127.425. Suppose our flight started to encounter turbulence. Since the choppiness of the air is often an altitude-related phenomenon, the crew might ask for a climb or descent to a new cruising altitude to make the ride more comfortable for their passengers. Atlanta Center, Riddle 1926, request flight level 340 for turbulence. Riddle 1926, descend and maintain flight level 340. The flight continues for a while in the smoother air. Eventually, it will become time for the plane to start descending into Memphis. The center controller has to consider the traffic and routing situation ahead before issuing any descent instructions. Another consideration will be the runway they'll use at their destination. Even though the flight is about 100 miles away from the Memphis airport, the controller will need to begin vectoring or directing the aircraft towards the runway approach area. The crew can still listen to the ATIS at Memphis since radio signals can be picked up very far away when at higher altitudes. Even if the ATIS were not yet audible, the center controller has access to the information at the airport on one of his screens and can relay it to the crew. Center informs the crew, Riddle 1926, ILS runway 18 right, approach in use at Memphis, expect descent in 10 miles. The crew begins configuring the avionics for the approach and preparing to start the descent. A couple minutes go by and they hear from center again. Riddle 1926, descent at your discretion, maintain flight level 230. The crew can start the descent whenever necessary based on what the flight computer tells them. Once they start the descent, they'll report it to ATC and level off at flight level 230. Just like the departure phase, there will be different controllers that have to clear the aircraft down to the lower altitudes, so one giant descent instruction is impractical. After some more controller changes and descent instructions, the crew is now close enough that they'll be receiving instructions from the Memphis airport. They'll be getting vectors onto the instrument approach for runway 18 right. An instrument approach is most useful in weather conditions where crews are operating in the clouds. There are specific altitudes and direction instructions on the approach that crews can automatically follow once being cleared for the procedure. This frees up some space on the radio and relieves the crew and ATC of some workload in the last 10 miles of the flight. About 5 miles from the airport, the approach controller hands the flight over to the tower. Riddle 1926, contact Memphis Tower on 128.425. Riddle 1926, Tower 128.425. 
About the same time as the crew switches the frequency on the radio, they'll begin the last descent of that flight that continues for a couple minutes and takes the plane all the way down to touchdown. Similar to Ernie's flight into St. Augustine, the crew of the Riddle Air Flight lands, clears the runway, and gets directions from the ground controller to taxi to their parking spot, or in this case, the terminal.